All right, here, come come closer so I can get the sound. But who do, who do you have in this photo? Oh, oh, you want me to talk? Yeah. All right, Malcolm, uh, Marsha Rose, when I mentioned you, know, I mentioned her. That's uh, Tavis, Nikki Rooney. Um, city of Philadelphia. So I'll just take the city of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Let's photo here. Let's photo here. Point what? to yourself. We're here? Mm-hmm. Oh, God, come on, point to myself. How could you, how could you miss? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Two women there, one of them black. Who you think that is? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I ain't Carol, huh? <laughs> well, we're from. Uh, you say me. black don't crack. <laughs> ask me. His, uh, the, the, uh, oh, Snyder. The, Snyder, yeah. Okay, who got Bill Custer. Vince. Marsha Rose, Malcolm. Okay, and then we come over here. Who you want here? These are some of the celebrities. Billy Daniels, Mickey Rooney. Okay, HBCU, you got an award? Yep. That was a big article in the uh, Philadelphia Sun. Okay. This is um, from New Jersey. Okay. Well, I'll just get a shot. And then this one, uh, Broadcasters Pioneer, Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame. And this one you should know has uh, Edie Huggins, uh, Mary, um, what's Mary's last name? Mary Mason. Huh? Mary Mason? Mason, Mary Mason, Georgie Woods, Malcolm, and myself. Wow. So, yeah, what was Philly like back in the 60s and 70s as far as being a, a celebrity and and just being a part of uh, that community, like Georgie Woods and Mary oh, Mason? Oh, Georgie had almost, well, when I got to meet him, no, no, it was good. It was good. It was good. In the black community, it was good. Um, that's from the Variety Club up there at the top. Mm -hmm. And um, but the the 60s and 70s, there, there definitely was a vibrancy in in media. You had the Tribune, you had well, see, we were all everybody was doing something. So for us, it was good. Mm -hmm. See, it was good because everybody was trying to beat everybody else and being the first and doing this and getting headlines and. But it seems it seems like all that sort of disappeared once once that door of segregation kind of went away. It, it or it was opened, I should say. Once once things became, I think, I think the men felt it more than the women because we weren't put out on the street. Mary had the strongest voice. Mm -hmm. Mary definitely had the strongest voice. She had the guts. Right, but I mean, in terms of, like, I remember in the '70s listening, and just there's a whole thing about being black and being in Philadelphia, and then something happened in the '80s where those things. I don't know what happened, but it just I sort mean, of disappeared. Because by that time, I was doing celebrities. Mm. So I was everywhere. But you were never like put out on TV to be the voice of black people the no, same way Mary, no, Mary Mason. No. no. And um, I think Mary was the, was the voice in those days for us. I don't know anybody on television who was here. Who was here? Mm. Because during the riots, even we were we weren't on the street, so to speak. You know what I mean? We weren't we weren't on the street. The men did it. Well, there's always going to be an echo. It's not, it's not going to come through on the tape. Um, if you don't hurry up, you're going to lose your time. <laughs> but I'm, I want to remember to turn the sound back up. I want to write that down. Um, so, sound, speaker. Sound, phone, oh. lights, and. And uh, um, not lights, um, yeah, plugs. Light <laughs> okay. All right. So, how's the levels? Can you give us a level? Level? Yeah. This is. I'm talking to you conversationally, right? Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. Testing. And I'm looking at you. Mm-hmm. All righty. Right. I'm looking at you. And I got to keep my eye <laughs> on the clock. All right. So. 
So, so. Where, can you introduce, or oh, I, I turned the phone off. Can you introduce yourself and, and uh, you know. I have to introduce myself? Yeah. Oh. Well, okay, well, okay. How okay. Would you, well, introduce yourself. You My be? name is Gertrude Rosalie Daniels Pender. Okay, better known as? Trudy Haynes. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Trudy, Trudy Haynes, you, you have a big birthday this year. What, what, uh, tell us where, where were you born and, and where? Where and what year? Or what, what's your birthday? If you don't mind. Or do you mind? My birthday, your birthday you can is your November birthday. 23rd, 1926. Okay, so you have, you have a big birthday this year. November. Happy birthday. Thank you. And Thank you. You've, you've been, you're a big, you're a broadcast pioneer. Can do you know some of your lists of firsts? Well, when I started, well, I started with radio, really, mm -hmm. in um, 1963, about the end of the, somewhere in the 50s. I don't remember the exact date. But I started working for radio, a radio station in Detroit, Michigan. Well, actually, it was, <laughs> was outside of Detroit called Inkster. Mm -hmm. Today, you would probably call that the Burbs. Mm -hmm. But it was in Inkster, Michigan, WCHB. It was a privately owned, or built, it was really built from brick by brick. So that's where I started, in the fields, doing brick by brick mm -hmm. <laughs> for a radio station that was uh, owned by two Detroit dentists. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started, with that radio station, right. as a receptionist. But you, you, you're, if you're not the first, you're one of the first. Well, that station was the first of the north, and, north of the Mason-Dixon line, owned by blacks. Okay. So it, it had history, too. So you and it's still on air. A broadcast radio pioneer. But in well, I wasn't a radio pioneer because there were people from the South, particularly, that were on radio and on white radio in Detroit. Mm -hmm. But this was a black-owned radio station with a black clientele. Mm -hmm. And they owned it, and I was the first woman director of that station. Okay. I was the first receptionist too. I started as a receptionist. <laughs> uh, but in Philadelphia. You in Philadelphia, I came here in 1965. Mm -hmm. I was recruited by W uh, KYW Channel Three, and that's the way I remained until I retired. Okay, and you were the first. First in the country, of doing TV news. First black broadcaster in the country doing TV news. Yes, and uh, uh, you're, you're around the same time. There are some other people that uh, around the first time that what? Well, the, around the same time, around the, the same time that uh, that you were uh, becoming a pioneer. There were other women that were becoming pioneers. Of no, only only whites were on the radio. I mean, on the TV at that time. Right. So I didn't have anyone to follow or emulate or practice from or All right. Well, I'm alluding discuss. to the Ebony Magazine article that featured you along with some other... No, they came after. Okay. They came after, yeah. You, you I was the first? the first in the country because I started doing weather. Okay. When I started at WXYZ in uh, Inks, not Inks, that, that, that was past, that became history. But when I started with WXYZ TV, in uh, Detroit, outside of Detroit, with South Southfield, I think it was called, and um, they started me on weather. And you you were so popular in Detroit that you got the call. I got a call from the KYW here in Phila in Philadelphia. Would I like to come join them? They offered me more money, and they offered me a chance to get back on the East Coast. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's a great way to segue. So going back, let's, we're, I, I wanted to talk today, uh, I wanted to talk about your life, your career, and then in terms of race, because that seems to be a big topic now. In terms of, and just Well, it was a big topic then, too, <laughs> because everybody was making the first. Bill Cosby was making his first on I Spy, and uh, Diane Carroll was making her first in Julia. And so everything was a first. Jackie Robinson was, was becoming a first. So there were a number of firsts that were coming along in that era. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but go, going back, you, you born in 1926 
in November 1926 in New York, right? Well, I mean, where I should ask you. I was born at Bellevue you? Hospital. At that time, it was the crazy house. <laughs> no, it was, it was the city. It was the city um, uh, center for people who didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you grew up? Uh, I grew up partly in Harlem and then moved to Queens. Okay. What, what was it like for Gertrude? Now, up. if you start that, we can end this right now, see? <laughs> what, what was it can like? Can you imagine coming on in there? Uh, this is Gertie reporting. Oh, come on. <laughs> Even I had sense in those days, that wasn't going to take. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what was it like for little Trudy in yeah. New York at, at the time growing up in Well, Hollywood? actually, it was little Gertie in those days because I was being called Gertie, flirty Gertie, dirty Gertie, tricky Gertie, all kind of Gerties, mm. which I didn't particularly like. And that was because there was a, a funny, uh, in the funny papers, uh, Dick Tracy, mm -hmm. and his nemesis was Gravel Gertie. Okay. So everybody had nicknames for me from that. But I also found out that there was a Trudy Washington, a light-skinned movie star. And I think, I think she played an imitation of life. I'm not sure about that. Freddie Washington. Freddie Washington, okay. But somehow, she, Someone in her family was called Trudy. I thought it was she. Okay. And uh, when I heard that for Gert Gertrude, that's how Trudy became. Okay. So what, what was it like for a little Trudy growing yeah. up in Harlem? It's been like a few minutes. Tomboy. Always getting into mischief, doing all the wrong things. And um, uh, advantageous and sort of gotten into everything, yeah. I did a, all the wrong things, but I was definitely a tomboy. Where, where'd you grow up? What block? Well, uh, in Harlem, mm -hmm. 119th Street, and my going out on Sundays was to walk up to 125th Street, mm -hmm. which was bustling with activity in those days, you know. But um, it was adventurous, but I lived mostly with an, old, uh, with an aunt in those days, and older people because she had rumors, and everybody in the building was in the apartment was older than me, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I was around older people a lot. I didn't have any brothers and sisters. Okay, any good friends at that age? At that age, I had one or two in the in the block in the neighborhood. Yes. And mostly black people you grew up with. In all That's all there was, okay. except the Irish policemen, and we got to know them all by name. And they got to know us because everything was, con you know, conduced and uh, surrounded. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the block knew who you were. So they were for, forever calling my aunt, come get this child. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was, uh, the, the block was your family. Right. And, and you grew up during the Depression. Yes. Well, WPA. What are, your, what are your memories of that time period? Well, when I moved out with my mother and father, who were on the, the work progress, my, my, yeah, but my mother was very um, progressive in that uh, she figured out ways to earn extra money. And one of the things that we did was to make sandwiches that we would take out to the men who were working on the railroad, so to speak. And we'd get up in the early in the morning, make these sandwiches, and take it out to them and earn a little extra money. And there were all kinds of ways that my mother would do things. And she adopted this whole idea of having rumors wherever we lived. lived. We always had rumors. And they were always older people. So my childhood was mixed with being around older people all the time. And I guess I was just lucky. In those days, uh, the men were gentlemen. They didn't rape you. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> I, 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 I came through with all, you know, here I am. No hard luck story to tell you. I understand. Um, and growing, in, in terms, in ter so being in Harlem, that's got to be a, a great thing. Like, did, did you, what, what was the political climate like? I don't Harlem? know what the political climate was well, at 10 and 11, 12 years old. I wasn't even thinking about politics. I was thinking about trying to get into the movies that were there. The Apollo was there. We couldn't go. And we had to go to church every Sunday and, and listen to people hallelujah style. 
and fan them, keep them from fading, and that was my childhood. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm trying to leap into your college years. Oh, now, if you're leaping into college, that's a different story because I wasn't living in Harlem at that time. Okay. I was living in Queens. Okay. And um, we, I don't know how I got involved. Oh, my godmother mm-hmm. told me that I should go to Howard University. And so we started the usual procedure of going down there, looking it over, and being accepted. And I was accepted. And um, I found out that I couldn't do everything I wanted to do because I didn't have a family who was going to be sending me money every time I wanted to do something. So I started working. Mm-hmm. And um, I took jobs as a waitress. I took jobs as an elevator operator. I took jobs as cleaning up white people's apartments. Okay. And what, what do you discover when, you, when you're cleaning white people's apartments? That had to go in the back door. That's what I discovered. Okay. And of course, Washington, D.C. at that time was, was segregated, or well, as if it's changed. But anyway, it was very segregated in those days. And so um, I didn't do that much. But I would protest. I had to. I wanted to walk in the front doors, and they would throw me out—not throw me out bodily, but tell me I couldn't come in. And uh, we learned that we, in those days um, at Howard, we couldn't go to the movies downtown unless we were going to go to the balcony. Uh, but I did meet a group of Howardites, and uh, children that are going to college are usually progressive, you know, and they'll take chances. And so they would wrap their heads up with towels and go down to the ticket office and, and use French. Doom way wa, do tickety. And <laughs> the white people would think they were from another country, particularly like Africa or someplace, that, you know, in the uh, east. Were they, were they trying and to let them get in. Were no, they, let them get into the movies. Oh, just to go to the movies. Yeah. But they weren't trying to do that in their whole. No, well, they did other things in some place else. Like um, it was after I graduated, but one of the fraternities had a party or a, re- a union, uh, what do they call them, conclave? Mm-hmm. And it was at one of the hotels down there that uh, was very particular who they took in, but they let them have this conclave up there. And they, we all got undressed and got our bathing suits on, went down to the pool and jumped in. Mm-hmm. Next day there was a big notice that we could only swim certain hours. Okay. And the, uh, the frat brothers protested and uh, broke the rules. Mm-hmm. It was a, uh, I won't say a conflict, well, it was a conflict. And finally, when they said we couldn't go in, they all came, about a hundred of them, mm-hmm. and jumped in the pool at the same time, and that broke it. Mm-hmm. So they closed the pool. Mm-hmm. Uh, they closed the pool? They closed the pool, <laughs> so nobody could go in. <laughs> <laughs> but so, I don't remember all the details of what happened because uh, this was a, a fraternity thing and we were just the girls that happened to be along, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't know everything. I just know that they did go down in unison, no. jumped in the pool at the time with all the white people because we had been given certain hours and we could go in. Mm-hmm. So then they jumped in and then there was a, a so. discussion. And they decided that they were going to go in the pool anyway, so I guess they closed it. So 1940s America, Washington, D.C., we know that there's some race prejudice against Oh, black. gosh, yes. There was always something going on downtown, like uh, Wanamaker's was a big store down there at the time. Was it Wanamaker's? I don't want to call the wrong name, but one of the, no, it wasn't Wanamaker's. It was a store that's now up here in, um, in upstate Washington. I can't remember, but it was a very high, um, high expense store mm-hmm. and I worked there but I could only get a job as an elevator operator or in the kitchen and if anybody of color came in to try on anything they would have to buy it mm-hmm. they couldn't just try it on and reject it mm-hmm. so if you weren't buying it don't try it mm-hmm. and it was Wanamaker no no Woodward Woodward and Lothrop oh okay Woodward and Lothrop yeah yeah. Uh, but I mean, was your, you're talking about for fraternities and sororities, were, was there internal prejudices in terms of Yes, at out? that time at Howard University, everybody wanted to know who your father was, what they did, 
and uh, what organizations you might belong to. There weren't that many to belong to, except we had NACP and Urban Leagues. But um, from the South, particularly, there were other organizations that um, were a little colorblind, mm -hmm. or not colorblind, I should say. Now, I've heard about the paper bag test. I don't know about that. If you're lighter than the paper bag. Or oh, is that bag. the way it goes? Well, I know that, <laughs> I know that there um, were a lot, of, a lot of tension a lot of times between the different colors, hues and who your father was. And I found out that my father wasn't from the right side because we were brown. And we didn't have any doctorate or any kind of um, thing in front of our name. President of this and, you know, those kind of things. Right. So, I mean, just to wrap up the Howard University experience, what are your final, what are your, what are your takeaways from your college years? What, what are your fondest memories? Well, it wasn't the most pleasant thing because I did experience some uh, rejection getting into the sororities and um, uh, the uh, color thing was very evident. Mm -hmm. As I said, who, where you were from and what your association was and those kind of things. But um, I have never been the kind of person who was uh, isolated from white experiences. For instance, when I was going to high school before college, I went to a bust school, okay? And where it was, where it was uh, outside of where I lived, it was mostly Jewish going to the school that I was bused to. And it was a school that was, um, uh, Elevated. It was like going to what do you have here when you go to a special school? Uh, charter. Like, yeah, or, it uh, wasn't charter school, before magnet. Magnet school. magnet school. It was like going to a magnet school. You had to have a certain uh, uh, average mm -hmm. in order to be bussed even to the school. Right. So uh, that experience was um, novel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then even when I, um, I went through a fast, accelerated junior high school. And when I went to uh, high school, from there, I was again going into a white neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I traveled quite a distance, uh, about 30, 35 to 40 minutes on buses to get back and forth to that school. In fact, one of the schools that I was so-called bus to or had to take a separate bus to get there was the same school that I met at KYW. Mm -hmm. A white lady that was at well, KYW okay. had gone to that. Well, well she went to that school after me, but well, say her, it was say the her same name school. So we have it for the record. Huh? Well, say her name, just so we have it, or if you can remember it. I remember it, I know it very well. Okay. <laughs> Still have a relationship with her, but it wasn't her fault. Okay. Uh, you know, so. But I, I just wanted to mention her name. Well, just. Marsha Rose. I went to the same school that Marsha Rose went to, but she lived in another part of town, and I had to get to that school. Okay. And, so, um, mm. But I, again, forged my way into something that I had no business doing. Like, I got on the, on the uh, cheering squad team there. I was the first at that school mm -hmm. to um, get on their cheering squad. Mm -hmm. And um, I, 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 I tell you, I'm, I'm that kind of person. I just forge into things without thinking that I'm not going to be accepted. Mm -hmm. so, and, th and that's a key. That's that's a key. Because maybe of those experiences. So w when you look back, I mean, do you see? I mean, how, how? What's your perspective on life? Is it a series of coincidences? Is it random and happenstance, or is there some sort of? Yeah, everybody of asks me that, and it's hard for me to say, "Oh, I was treated so badly," and "Oh, I couldn't do this." I tried to get into um, the. Um, Waves mm -hmm. when I was still in the, when I was gonna, getting ready to graduate because all the girls were going into the all the fellows were going into service and they started the waves and the um, wax and there was another one I think for the Air Force mm -hmm. and I said okay I'm going to try to get in the waves well I was rejected because they weren't taking blacks at that time mm -hmm. and um, when I came right out of school, I, I applied for um, airline hostess. Well, they weren't taking blacks at that time, you know. 
So I've been, it's been a series of rejections, but on the other hand, when I applied for the job for KYW, uh, for WXYZ in Detroit, in Detroit, he said, come on out, let's see what you can do. So, you know, it's been an up and down. All through college I worked, and when I came home I worked, and they had a lot of uh, places that were working for the war. And so I had jobs where I was the only black person there. So that, that, that became a trend. What, what, what do you think it was about you or your personality that got your foot in the door? Well, I guess they said, well, we can take one, and if she's going to be the one, <laughs> there she is. I don't know. Okay. I, I never approached anything with the idea that I could not. Mm. Now, I've been rejected, but I tried, you know. And sometimes I maybe just slipped through. That's <laughs> all. But after doing that, I found that <sighs> I don't know what people are afraid of. I think in groups, maybe because I was by myself, that I was accepted. And then they could pat themselves on the chest or on the back and say, well, we got one, you know, one of those kind of things. And, and um, the people who didn't like me, uh, they didn't bother me. I don't know what they said behind my back, but I never carried my, myself in that way. Mm. You know, I, right. So before we get into the broadcasting career, I know you did spend some time overseas before. Yeah, so, yes. I, went, I, I was in the special services, and there again I stuck my head into something that I didn't know about. While we were traveling over, I found out there were a group of women on ship, uh, and these were all Army. Uh, or forces. Tra traveling over? Uh, by boat. To? What, le what led you to over? My oh. father. Okay. My father was in the service, and um, this was post-war, uh, and they would let families come over. So one day when my mother said, well, I'm going over to join your father, I said, me too. So I <laughs> quit my job and went with them, and on the way over I found out uh, I bumped into a group of girls that were going over to join specials. They had already been accepted, mm -hmm. and they were going to get placed overseas. And I asked them, how could I do it? And they said, oh, well, I don't know that you can now because we've already, you know, we've already been accepted. So when we landed, I went to the fourth, to the, um, the station ma manager. And I said, look, I'd like to join the city. So I think he figured, well, she's already here. We don't have to pay for her to come over, mm -hmm. so let her join. So I joined special services. Okay. Okay. But in that time, in those days, of course, all of the camps were segregated. Mm -hmm. So I worked on a camp that was for blacks, you know, servicemen, okay. all right, so with white officers. We've, we've got about <laughs> 20 minutes left, I think, to, to talk. But uh, like we are parents, Give their names and, and what were what are your fond memories of them? What are my fond memories of them? Yeah. They were good people. Okay. Um, I, I all my life I've been around older people, mm -hmm. and so I retain some of their older ways and habits of courtesy, respect, of um, sharing. Those are the things I learned from the people that were very close to me. It wasn't always my mother and my father, but my mother and I became excellent friends to her death because when she came here, we were like, every place I went, I took her. And people still remember, oh, I remember you and your mother. So we became very good friends. Um, but all of my life, I've been around older people without having a brother and a sister and a cousin. I didn't have cousins. I didn't have anyone, and I'm still alone. But they were my backbone. They were my support. Mm -hmm. All of those older people, I can call them off. You would know them because they're all in the grave. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Well, you, but name your parents' names, just so. We... Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Daniels. Okay. Uh, and you're, you're you're married, to be fair. Uh -huh. You say you're 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 within your own. You're you're a loner. Mm -hmm. That's your personality. Yeah. I'm sorry I don't have a, 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 a kind of a tale for you where everything was bleak. 
I've been a very blessed person, very blessed. And um, I feel by doing this show, having come out of KYW, and by trying to do it, I'm trying to, in my way, that I know to give back. I think there are things that don't get uh, mentioned or discussed on regular television that I try to do with, with uh, doing stories on community service things, people in our community who have accomplished many things, um, organizations that are uh, trying to uplift our communities. And so those are things that I'm concentrating on my show. And uh, that's what I want to do. So where, 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 at what point do you become Trudy Haynes? I'm always Trudy Haynes. Like when you no, sat down here, <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always putting my mouth into something. I have a habit of saying what I feel right off the bat without saying, will this make friends or not? And I sometimes, uh, I, don't, I don't strike it rich. <laughs> I say things I shouldn't say. But, but in terms of um, the, become, the career in broadcasting, what, what year do you, you end up in Inkster? Here? What? Um, well, well, how do you how do you how do you first get on TV? Um, how did I first get on TV? How did you land your first TV job? I guess. Uh, in Detroit, mm -hmm. by um, being a woman's editor, uh, and and I don't know why, but I was always invited to all the luncheons for any kind of uh, communication event. And sitting at the table, I overheard the. Um, uh, one of the guys said that he was looking for a, a replacement because he was losing his weather girl. Mm -hmm. And I called him up and said, I'd like to recommend someone. He said, who? And I said, me. And at that point, you'd been on radio. And I was with radio then. Mm -hmm. And he told me to come out, Mr. Pivel. I'll be very happy to name him mm -hmm. because uh, John Pivel uh, seized an opportunity for himself and his station because he was the first in the country to hire me, and I was the first one. And he took a lot of flack for that. Yeah, were your co-workers welcoming as he No. Was? <laughs> first of all, very few women, except for the Weather Girls at ABC, that was the network, uh, very few women were in this business. And um, so I didn't even have white girls to follow, you see. And he took a chance with that. And he took a lot of beef with that, too. So I give him credit. But he probably said to himself, it's going to happen one of these days. If not him, not me, who? <laughs> you know? And I guess you were, you were telling me earlier, when you were in, the Civil Rights Movement was popping up around the same time, early 60s. Yes, and I was, I was an active member with the Urban League, with the NACP, in those days, mm -hmm. you know. But um, once you get on air, your, your time is limited, but well, I did whatever I could. What, what are your thoughts on Martin and Malcolm? Like it seems like. Well, I knew both of them, and I interviewed both of them, mm -hmm. and they both were strong people that <sighs> had reasons for what they did, and which could be applied in our life. Both of them had a structure, mm -hmm. and both of them had something that we could take with us in our lives. And the courage and the strength and the fortitude from both of them. It was like having uh, Frazier and Allie. Mm -hmm. Well, now, um, I can't call him Allie, can I call him? Yeah, yeah Muhammad. Call him. Okay. When people would say, oh man, Frazier, I like Frazier. No, oh, man, I like Allie. Uh uh. We needed both of them. And there was no reason to ever pull each apart. As a, as a group of people, we needed both of them. And we were very fortunate to have both of them. So I felt the same way about Malcolm and, and um, the Reverend. And did you feel, when you got on the air, did you feel some sort of responsibility to represent the entire race? To represent the entire race? Into I was representing the entire race, entire race by being on the air. They were looking to me to be intelligent, to be dependable, to be honest, to be strong. Mm -hmm. So everything that I did or say or said was being criticized one way or the other. 
and I wanted it to be the best that I could give them. Now, there, there are a lot of people, we talked to Dick Gregory, he says it's, it's wrong to tell kids that they have to, if black kids, that they have to be twice as good to get half as far. But it seems like that, that was the case. For your no, generation. I think, um, I think when we say twice as good, that's being as good. Mm -hmm. Because we don't have the same opportunities and chances that others have. So when we say twice as good, to me that means go into something saying, yes, I can, and let them find out that you can't. I never said to anyone, oh, I can't do this. When they asked me, could you be a weather girl? I said, yes. I didn't know the first thing about weather, except the when a toe hurts. <laughs> so, um, so you say yes. Let them find out that you can't. And by the time they find it out, you can't. So, I mean, so highlights, what, when you think, like when you come to Philadelphia and you are actually doing news, you know, what are some of the highlights of, of the career, like interviews that you've done or stories that you covered? Well, of course, marching down Broad Street with uh, Martin Luther King was one of the highlights. Um, interviewing Lady Bird Johnson was another highlight. Um, there's so many. Oh, I just I just can't remember well, them tell all. Tell us about Martin Luther King. I, didn't, I knew he was out West Philly. I didn't know about the Oh, Broad no, Street. no. He, he marched here. He marched from, oh, I guess it was probably at that time, um, Cecil B. Moore's Street, mm -hmm. all the way down to City Hall. And we all marched with him. And I was carrying a mic like you do <laughs> when you follow people at the same time. I don't know where that thing is now. Right. Uh, the, um, the footage. The footage, yeah, because we had a big fire at KYW and a lot of stuff was destroyed. Mm -hmm. So. But you, you were on air every day doing news. I was on every day as a reporter. Mm -hmm. And But some of your contemporaries, let's go to the Ebony Magazine article. I don't have it with me, but um, I thought that was so cool that I could Google Tree Haynes and find out that you were one of the cover stories of Ebony Magazine. Well, there were three of us. The one in girl in New York, the girl in New York, and Edie. Edie Huggins here. Myself, the girl in New York, and Edie Huggins. Mm -hmm. well, so was that a big event? Oh, when you say event, to each of us, yes, I, I'm sure. But that was Ebony Magazine, which I was proud to be in. And um, I don't think it drew much attention in, in white areas, or mm -hmm. I never remember having any formal acknowledgement from mm -hmm. anybody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, well, you know, I guess uh, when I think in, in terms of so wh where do you think we are now in terms of the racial backwards. conversation? <laughs> backwards. Okay. But, oh, I shouldn't say just backwards. Well, tell it's the probably truth, happened. Girl. Well, uh, I think there was more um, projection of black talent when I was coming along because everyone was fighting to be first and to be out there in the front to do that. Mm -hmm. But now it's become a norm. And so the same attention isn't given. For instance, uh, we don't have, we haven't graduated to having CEOs and managers. Um, we had two managers at KYW, black, who have long gone and we haven't had a replacement since. You know, so I don't see, we, we've reached a, a level. Mm -hmm. And everybody says, oh, we got them, we got them, we got them. But, we haven't advanced that. We haven't covered, stepped so, over that. So I was very upset when Melissa Perry was missing, mm -hmm. and I don't know what the reason is, but uh, there was a talent there that should be all over this world, mm -hmm. and now it's gone. And um, mm -hmm. I hope not gone, but. Well, she'll land on her feet, but the fact yeah. that uh, now that we're basically the Obama era's ending, yeah, and, and I, 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 I kind of yeah, yeah, and and Oprah hasn't been able to really break certain barriers as much as as great as she is. Um, they're still holding back on her. Mm -hmm. the, see, we don't have the open door policy mm -hmm. all over, and that that 
uh, and I don't think we've made that much progress. I think we've, we've stopped someplace. They've stopped us. Mm -hmm. I would like to say that anyone looking at this show and thinking about our progress should take into consideration that the most important thing that we need as a group of people is education. Because if you can't read that final print, that little print, and if you don't understand what's being thrown at you, then you can't combat it. I think education is our biggest and most important ally that we should take into consideration. We're not doing that. We're, we're not we're, doing we're, that. We're being given license to fail at this point. Given what? License to fail. Like a, yes, a lot of yes. the social structures. And they have, they have to realize that if you don't have the education, you don't realize it. Right. But even family structure, like you, even though even if you weren't raised by your parents' nuclear family, you had people around you. Around me. That exactly. saw something in you and encouraged that. Yeah. So I don't and they know. know. They didn't even know what it was going to be. But they kept edging me and pushing me. And uh, that family has been broken down. Mm -hmm. And they've taken, a, they've taken good measure to break it down. And we have to understand that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the education is the most important thing. Well, before we wrap up, now, a lot of people, they may get the sense that because you're on TV, you had to sort of have like a neutral stance. You couldn't get on TV and have an afro and things like that. At one time we couldn't. I know two girls that were, I don't remember where they are now, but two girls that came to our station and were let go for attempting to wear an Africa, Af Africa, an afro. Um, and I remember when one of these uh, managers had, uh, called me in and wanted me to get rid of my gray hair. So those, that type of, but I know that you were active in the movement. You were telling me a story about speaking at a school. I just wanted you to share that because I know so. Speaking where? You were speaking at a school to some young people. Um, oh, that was at Howard? I Are think you talking so. about Howard? Yeah. And, uh, oh, well, at Howard, when you talked talking about the, um, the race issue or the, this was more of a, what do you call it, a class issue, I guess. Um, when I went there, of course, it was, like you said, a, a paper brag. <laughs> but then that changed. And when I was invited to come back to speak to the audience, I saw a multitude of hair, Afro hair things and power to the people. And I said, I got the wrong speech ready, so I had to put it down. And when I got up to speak, instead of saying, hello, my name is Trudy Haynes, I said, out of the people. And I went into a whole speech that wasn't even written down there. And when I finished, they gave me a hand. But I would have had the wrong speech up there. I don't know if that's the one that you're thinking about. Story, but so. on site, I had to realize that times have changed. Mm -hmm. you know. and, and a good thing. Good thing. Uh, I, I was proud of them. Mm -hmm. and so I, so any, any thoughts? People that are looking to break into sh the entertainment or the news industry? Yeah, get behind the cameras. That's where the money is. That's where the longevity is. That's where the talent is, really. I mean, I was fortunate enough to break in it this way, but now I'm doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it requires more. Well, well speak, speak to that. Where, where, where is Trudy Haynes in 19, or sort of 2006? 2016, excuse me. Yeah. I'll start over. Where is Trudy Haynes <laughs> in 2016? Well, I am here trying to put on a show on TV. I've had a lot of chances, and I've done a lot. I was on Bounce for a while. I was on KYW for a while. But uh, to have the uh, sustainability is what is important. You know, you can get a lot of places, but if you can't stand, stay there. It doesn't matter. And so now I'm trying to do it the right way, maybe, of getting my support in advance mm -hmm. to put on a show that I can do some of the things I've been telling you about. Right. I'm still out here working. I run into you all the time on the red carpets. And 
Yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been doing little bits and pieces here and there and on shows and on TV. I did something in, in uh, Delaware. I was on television down there. I came, went over to Jersey with television there, but I haven't, and I was even television here on my own station, but costly. <laughs> <laughs> costly. Yeah. Well, you know, I need help, folks. <laughs> we need black wealth to invest yes, we in do. our media. And we also have to have people that understand that they should advertise. Mm. Our black folks in business don't consider that too much. Understood. All right. Well, I thank you. I thank you. And I love what you're doing. It's your, it's your nook that you found, and that's great. Well, I, w I, know, I know you didn't want to sit long. Did, was this, did this feel long for you? No. Okay. You could have talked You're talk easy. Long. You could have talked longer. No, no, I, I don't have that. I don't have that much to say. Is there anything I missed mm -hmm. that you really want to get? No, except that I hope, I hope the education part will, will reach ears, because we need, we need good thinkers. We need good thinkers, even to the point of understanding about election, and how much, how important the primary is, because. That's when you vote for the people who make your life good or bad. That, those are people, not the president. He hardly even knows us, whoever the president is. But those, those primary people, your city council, your state representative, the ones you send to the Congress, there's where your vote does count, and it does count. Because that's when they sit at the table and say, where are we going to put this money? Well. These folks over here didn't vote. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you don't get the money. Exactly. It's to fix the roads, to fix the electricity, to fix the this and that. It's all about power it's, and it's, yes. power and collective. And you've got to understand that. It's not the presidential vote. Yeah, they it's want you to the think that it's in a between big guy. votes that yeah. vote for the people who sit near you, walk around the street that you're going around, you know. Right. They, they, the want, they want you to think that it's just a bunch of, of 1%, 2% that own everything and they control everything. That the city council meets every week deciding who should get help. Excellent. All right, I want to take a little quick tour of some of these photos while he's packing okay. up. And, uh, oh, last thing, if you look into the lens, say your name and you're watching Real Black. I'm Trudy Haynes, alias Gertrude Rosalie Daniels Pinder. <laughs> Watch Real Black. You're watching Real Black. You're watching. I'm Trudy Haynes, and you're watching Real Black. <laughs> you still got it. All right. I can't even do a bottle with this one. How am I going to do I'm a bottle working, with I that? told you, anything that I have is yours. Well, I don't have someone to edit. Oh, I can't. Well, that's, that's, that's my time. Good, yeah. That's my time. What do we have back here, Miss Trudy? Go around the other way. Well, OK. Well, I, they're backwards that way. Mm -hmm. No, this one isn't. This is the, um, the oh, well, my thing came off. Oh, no, here it is. This is the um, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. The Emmy. The Emmy. Hmm? Your Emmy. Yeah, this is my Emmy. And this, all of these, some of them in my apartment, though. OK. You want to get up and give me a tour? Huh? This photo here, all state. Uh, you I'm don't sorry. even realize how much you, you should be like on tour teaching. No time looking at that, John. What do they? What do they do? Giving back. Oh, this is very socially conscious film. This is who? This is a very socially conscious film. How, it is? How, Why? Reclaiming your neighborhood, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's recording already. And after they reclaim it, what do they do with it? I don't know. Then they dance and there's the credits. Huh? They, they dance and then there's the credits. Oh. Well. So we need to check focus. I mean, everything can't be on the order of, of uh, uh, concussion or something like that, I understand that. You know whose humor I used to like? Oh, it was sorry. probably before your time. 
Um, okay. Yeah, well, this is good. Oh, yeah. God, his name is right on my tongue. He's doing, he, they're doing late shows on him. I don't know if you've done anything on him. Um, the black comedian? Yeah. He was excellent. Prior? No, before Prior. Uh, um, weren't that many people before Prior? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. George Kirby? Uh, no. Dick Gregory? No, Bill Dick Chomsky. was okay. He was a little short guy. My mother made me, what's him called, made me do it. Oh, he, uh, uh, what's his face? P Pygmy Martin. Who? Oh, Pygmy or? No, Flip no, Wilson? no. When he's, Geraldine made me do it. Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson. Fantastic. That's the, uh, every time I get a message on my thing. Oh, is there a way to turn that down? Or? Yeah, if you can find it. And don't forget to disconnect the phone. You did. The yeah, Flip Wilson. They're playing all his old stuff now. That guy was, he was a genius. Without cussing, without belittling, without acting the jackass, he was funny as hell. My father didn't like him because. Huh? So my father didn't like him because he wore a dress. Because he what? He wore the dress. The drawer? The, the dress, dress, Geraldine? Yeah, but it was a character. I know. Yeah, well, your father has a right not to like him. Uh, your father's older, and he's, he, yeah, he's, he, he, can, he didn't, it, that was before his time. <laughs> Drag, you know.